All right, got a long way to go. Short time to get there. Are we a zombie nation? Yeah. I'm going to start off with trying to bring us up to date on current events. One of the big current hoorahs right now is, uh, you know, the TSA. Holy moly. <laughs> The Nazi Gestapo, if they got their hands on you, and they got you down there in the basement of Gestapo headquarters, yeah, they do all kinds of unspeakable things to you, cattle prods, you name it, strip you off. But even the Hitler's Nazis did not, you know, they, they knew better than to try to fondle people and make them strip off in a public place. The Germans would not have put up with it. We are. Oh, because... They have to, we have to be protected from the terrorists. Well, I'm here to tell you the only terrorists are in Washington, D.C. Right. Are there Middle Eastern terrorists? Are, are there Middle Eastern fanatics who would like to harm us? Yeah, there are. But if left to their own devices, they, you know, they're doing good to you know, get a ride on camp. They couldn't get over here. They couldn't do anything. You need state-sponsored support to pull off Things like Tobar Towers and 9-11, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm going to talk about that some too, because after all, that's the, that's the foundation of everything that's going on. Well, we've got to be protected. We've got to be protected. Well, listen, listen now. Like most other things, let's, let's peel this back and look at it a little bit. These full body scanners came into vogue last Christmas with the so-called underwear bomber. The guy who stuffed his underwear with PETN a military grade explosive, which according to my knowledge and my sources in the military, you cannot light it with a match. It requires a detonator. He didn't have a detonator, but what he did have was a well-dressed gentleman that escorted him onto that airplane. Okay? Even though he's on a transatlantic flight on a one-way ticket and no luggage. And even though his father had gone to the U.S. Embassy a few weeks before and warned that he would, had been falling under bad influences and was probably a danger. And then we found out last January in congressional testimony that the State Department said they were not going to renew his visa. In other words, he would not even have been able to get on that airplane except the U.S. intelligence agencies twisted their arm and said, no, let him on. So U.S. intelligence agencies let him on the airplane Knowing full well what he was doing, he had this PETN stuffed in his underwear, but he didn't have a detonator, so they knew there wasn't any real danger in that airplane. And what was going on at that time? Congress was renewing and reviewing some of the more odious sections of the Patriot Act, thinking about repealing them. Well, boy, we got the underwear bomber. Oh, almost lost an aircraft. That, that went by the by. And the next thing we you know, we're bombarded in the media by none other than Michael Chertoff, who's telling us you got to have full body scanners at the airports to stop this terrible threat. Well, number one, experts from around the world, including the head of security for uh, Israel, uh, El Al, the Israeli airline, says these backscatter full body scanners, chances are, would not have detected the PETN anyway, because it's kind of like C4, it's plastic. All right, so that's not doing any good. And then when we get to hear Chertoff say, you got to have this for your security, all we hear is he's the former head of Homeland Security. They never quite pointed out, but I do in my book, which came out last in June, that his marketing group now is chief client is Rapid Scan, the manufacturer of the full body scanners. It's a scam, folks, just to make money. This time last year, we were all fearful over swine flu. It's going to kill us. What happened to that? Nothing. Except the pharmaceutical companies made a killing off of it. Okay? It, now, and finally, here's the clincher. Now, because so many people were beginning to realize the dangers of the radiation of the full of body scanners, not to mention the absolute insanity of of presenting your naked body to anybody who wants it. And here's a couple of lies they tell you. They tell you, oh, you can't really see all the features. And then they show you the negatives on TV where it doesn't look so bad, but a negative is a negative. 
All you got to do is reverse the image, and you got a full color body scan of your body, every little wrinkle, every little mole, every little hair, every little piece of your genitalia. Exactly. Now, who in the heck signed up for that? Okay? I mean, terrorists just want your life. Tyrants want your freedom, and that's what they're getting. And if we allow this to go forward, if we put up with this kind of stuff, then the terrorists have won. All right? It's just not worth all that. Now, again, the, and then they tell you, well, we're not keeping those pictures any. You read it right here. West Virginia, they found they had thousands of them stashed back. So they're getting naked, not only getting your naked pictures, they're keeping it. I also cited an example of a rock star from India who was coming through Heathrow over in, in uh, uh, England and went through the full body scanner, and before he got out of the airport, some of the women employees of the airport were coming up to him with copies of his naked body scan saying, can we get your autograph? <laughs> and he thought that was kind of cool, so that's all right for him. I don't know about you guys, but uh, I don't want to sign an autograph to my naked body scan. <laughs> Not that I have anything to be ashamed of. <laughs> Not that I have anything. <laughs> But, but and, and finally, to get off of this, here, uh, the day before Thanksgiving, highest, highest uh, travel day of the year, uh, the opponents had decided that was going to be opt-out day. And they were trying to tell everybody, if you're flying, opt out of that full body scan. And they figured that's going to jam it up and show the TSA that we're not putting up with this nonsense. So what does the TSA do? The TSA, who has told us we've got to have these body scanners, they're essential for our security. They got to be there 24 7. They turn them off. And they say, that's all right, go around. And let everybody go around. Instead of showing people and showing the news and the news showing the public the tremendous groundswell of opposition to this insanity, they turn them off. And what does that tell us? It tells us it's not essential to our security. It was essential. They'd say, well, it's essential. you got to do it. No, it turned off. And folks, we're being scammed up and down the line because we're a zombie nation. And I can prove that to you, too. Slide. We know that these banks whose liabilities outweigh their assets, they're broke. They're dead. And yet they've been propped up with taxpayer money, so they're still going through the motions. So they've been called zombie banks. All right, now consider that depending on who you want to listen to, we collectively in this nation owe between 12 and 15 trillion dollars. And yet, it's also been estimated that if every man, woman, and child in this country sold every asset they've got, we couldn't come up with but about nine or 10 trillion dollars. We're broke, folks. We're broke, we're dead. But we don't know it because the stores are still open. We can still get gasoline. We're still going through the motions. We're a zombie nation. And why should that be? If you want to think about conspiracy, think about this. The United States of America is still a very rich nation in natural resources, aren't we? We've got lots of gas and oil in Texas. We've got coal in the Northeast. we got, you know, we got lots of resources. We got all that rich farmland in the Midwest. Okay, so we've got tremendous natural resources. And we have a population of 310 million people that are, despite what you see on the freeway, semi-literate. <laughs> we got a pretty literate, literate work, workforce. And most Americans I know want to work. They're willing to work, they want to work, they want some good, honest work. So we've got a literate workforce, we've got all these natural resources. Why then are we in such terrible economic shape? Why? Well, I'll tell you why. Somebody wants it that way. Somebody wants it that way. Why do you think all the jobs go out? Right? H. Ross Perot, back 2000, tried to tell us of this sucking sound. I can still hear it. There goes all the jobs. It was all the industry. Somebody wants it that way. Well, let's figure out what's going on. Slide. So in my new book, I not only talked about the financial meltdown, 
um, what caused the crash, liars, loans. These banks, it's incredible what they're pulling on us. And now you know they had this moratorium on the foreclosures because they were taking people's mortgages and they were taking the good ones and then packaging them with the bad ones and then calling it a good investment, calling them derivatives, bundling them together and then sell them to other banks and sell them to other banks and sell them to foreign banks. And somewhere along the way, the paper trail got lost. You didn't have the original deeds. You had nothing. And they were hiring people just to sign foreclosure notices, all right, who had no idea of the true legal trail of that mortgage. And there are people now who are getting out of the mortgages because the banks and the people that bought these derivatives cannot prove that they have any kind of real title to that property. All right? And so, so they put a moratorium on foreclosures. Well, of course, that's to the benefit of the banks, number one, because if you run somebody out of their home and sits vacant, then the vandals take over, it falls into disrepair, and it's not worth what it was to begin with. So it's actually to their benefit to let people stay in their home because they'll keep it up and keep the value of the property up. But the big problem is, is that a lot of them can't show clear title to that property. But don't worry about it. Look, your politicians are on the job, and they're already now that Obama, they had this going right before the election, but Obama failed to sign it because he, he wanted to keep things rocking along, give the Democrats a little better chance there in November. Uh, but now they're running it through again this time in the past, and retroactively it's going to say, hey, if you've got a signature somewhere, you don't have to have trip title. If you've got just a, some, some uh, notary public, that's good. And we'll take your house, we'll take your property. So it's, this is uh, liberty for the bankers, by the bankers, and to the bankers. But I go further than that. We get into Codex Alimentarius. Anybody know what that is? Yeah. There's one. Yeah, well, of course. <laughs> a couple more. You better start paying attention to this because they get this through and they've been trying to pass these laws through Congress and they can't get it through because of the health advocates. But now what they're doing is they're making an end run because now they're signing this up with these treaties with the European Union and they already got it working in the European Union and this is the trying to save you and trying to protect the quality of your drugs and food and stuff. What it means though is, in the not too distant future, you're going to have to pay a doctor's office fee to go and get a prescription so you can get vitamin C or B or D3. And by the way, if you're not taking D3, you should be. That will knock out a whole lot of your problems with colds and flu and everything else. But they don't want you to know that and they want you to get a prescription for it. Again, we're being zombified. Biological weapons. And here you're going to read how the they came up, they used a Nazi bi biological weapon. They developed a mutated protein called a mycoplasma. And uh, it's a beautiful biological weapon because it gives you all of the triggers of viruses and bacteria, but it's not a virus or a bacteria. Okay? So when you get sick, uh, number one, it acts individually. It'll act on whatever your immunization system breakdown allows it to operate on. And uh, the norm, your normal doctor or physician is not going to be able to find a, the uh, virus or the bacteria. So they're not going to know where it even came from. This is why, by the way, that we have all of this rash of new diseases that we've never even heard of 20 years ago. Fibromyalgia chronic fatigue syndrome, all this stuff. They don't know what to call it because it's biochemical weapons started by the Nazis and perfected right here in Fort Detrick and Plum Island. All right? Read all about it. They're zombifying us through biochemical weapons. Drugging the public. Well, let's move on through. Slide. Yep, we've got a real problem here. Slide. And now we got tea parties, and let me just, uh, you know, but, but who, well, I get to that. Another slide. <laughs> Let's go back. It basically all comes back to money. Everybody <coughs> runs on money. Our whole society runs on money. Didn't used to. Back in the early, early civilizations, it ran on religion. Religion told you how to think, how to act, how to conduct your business, and how to live. But then with the advent of the printing press and the 
and the uh, Gutenberg Bible. And you, you all realize for a few hundred years after you've been in the printing press, it was illegal to print the Bible. They don't want that. They don't want you reading about the Bible. They don't want you reading the Bible so you can read for yourself what's in the Bible. Only the priest can tell you what was in the Bible. And uh, but, but finally, you know, so the first bootlegging copyright infringement was the Bible. And they were passing Bibles around. Bibles were quite popular. Uh, you know, it's kind of like when I traveled in Tibet. Uh, you could get along better with uh, pictures, little pictures of the Dalai Lama than you could with money. Because they wanted those pictures of the Dalai Lama because they were outlawed. Time you outlaw something, make it, uh, make it desirable. So anyway, so now religion lost its chokehold, and so economics took over money. We operate under the golden rule. Whoever has the gold makes the rules. So even Benjamin Franklin says the colonies would gladly have borne the little tax on tea and other matters had it not been that England took away from the colonies their money, which created unemployment dissatisfaction. The colonies, the original 13 colonies, uh, issued colonial strip, which was based on the goods and services of those colonies. It was worth some, and it was good, it was stable, and the colonies were prospering. The international bankers didn't have their finger in the pie, so they didn't like that. So they pressured King George and they passed a law saying that outlawed colonial script said you had to use only Bank of England notes, read Federal Reserve notes. You could only use Bank of England notes. That's what caused the revolution, not the little tax on the tea and, and the stuff that you're taught in school. Now we're talking about the dumbed down education system. Don't even want to go there. Slide. And Lenin, he understood it. He said the surest way to destroy a nation is to debauch its currency. Isn't that what's happening to us right now? Yes. And again, back to education. Give me four years to teach the children, and the seed I've sown will never be uprooted. If they get your kids and tell them, oh, we have to save the environment, then they're all for that, which is fine. I'm all for that, too. But not when it comes to taking away private property, taking away your guns, you know, taking away free enterprise. But this is, you teach the children, and you've got it. Slide. And it all comes back to the money plot of 1910, when Paul Warburg of the Warburg banking family of Germany and a and close uh, uh, expanded uh, family of the Rothschilds, he comes over to the United States and was with those people on Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia in 1910, along with Frank Vanderlip and the others of the big banking guys on Morgan's Island, J.P. Morgan's Island, and they concocted the idea of the Federal Reserve System. Now, the thing they decided was, they said, uh, we must never refer to this as a central bank, because the central bank had been tried in early day of America, and every time they set up a central bank, it was corrupt, and it caused dissatisfaction, unemployment, and ran people out of their homes because it was the interest charged on debt that will ruin you. You all know what I'm talking about. You pay on those credit cards, you pay on those credit cards, and when you look, you look at your statement each month, you're just paying interest. You know, you, you're just scrambling, doing all you can, just trying to pay the interest. You'll never get the principal paid back. And we owe so much money in this country now, we'll never get the interest, we'll never get the principal paid back. So we're just, you know, we're a debtor nation, we're dead, we're zombies. Paul Warburg comes and then becomes president of the uh, first board of governors of the Federal Reserve System. Slide. And there he is, original Federal Reserve Board. Now, during World War I, Paul Warburg, fresh off the boat from Germany, founder of the Federal Reserve System, was in charge of the finances, war finances for us for World War I. Okay, slide. His brother, Max, was in charge of the financing for the Germans. How do you like that? One brother finances the German, one brother finances the United States. And uh, Max had been head of the Warburg Company, principal stockholder in the Reichs Bank, co-founder of IG Farben, the giant chemical combine of which all the giant pharmaceutical corporations of today trace back to. He was also helped arrange the seal rail car that sent Lenin through wartime Germany and into Russia to take Russia out of the war, which freed up millions of German soldiers who came over to face the Allies. He was one of the ones that helped create communism, 
so, uh, the communist uh, socialism, Marxist socialism in Russia, and he was a board member of Hamburg American Steamship Line along with Prescott Bush, the grandfather of our just past president, the father of George Herbert Parker Bush, uh, more of which we'll hear about. Uh, and, slide. and so these Western capitalists on Wall Street, where Lenin was in Switzerland when the Russian Revolution broke out, so Max Warburg and others sent him through Germany into Russia. Trotsky, their philosophical leader, was in New York living on Rockefeller land and working for Wall Streeters. They sent him over there and with uh, uh, Jacob Schiff did, other Wall Street giants with millions of dollars, both other revolutionaries, sent him to Russia to take over the revolution and create communism in Russia. Now, why would Western capitalists want to create socialists in, in Russia? Because they were trying to set up what we grew up knowing as the Cold War. The Socialist East versus the Capitalist West, they play them off against each other for maximum profit and control. Okay? <coughs> they had a problem. <coughs> Lenin died, Stalin took over, and Russia turned into an iron-handed dictatorship, and he would not allow the Western bankers in. They would not allow a central bank in Russia. They used their own money that they issued. Well, this caused a problem. So what did they do? Slide. Oh, this shows that the uh, early days, this is a cartoon from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch in 1911, showed they understood it. See, it shows all the Wall Streeters, including uh, uh, John D. Rockefeller and Morgan and uh, even Teddy Roosevelt, all shaking hands with Karl Marx. They knew the close collusion between these Western capitalists and their creation of communism in Russia. Slide. And of course, we also know that the Communist Manifesto echoed the same platform as the earlier Bavarian Illuminati. Can you read that for yourself? It's, this, is, this is the plan of socialism. The idea of socialism is not bad. Socialism says, okay, that is the public owns the means of production, distribution, etc. And of course, it's been extended to mean, well, the you know, socialist program, you're going to take care of everybody. And I think we all agree that there are people who are needy, destitute, ill, uh, you know, have disabilities, the, the aging, and there needs to be programs to help these people. No question about it. So, socialism as a concept is not necessarily bad or evil. Uh, but just like democracy, it sounds great on paper, okay? But if you think about it, the classic example of democracy in action is a lynch mob. The majority say hang him, so you hang him. We don't want that. We weren't given that. We were given a democratic republic. Well, what's the difference? <clears throat> a democratic republic, you have to have legal representation. There's a system of laws, checks and balances. And you have to be, get a fair trial. You get to face your accusers. You get to face the evidence against you. You get a trial by a jury of your peers. And then if you're found guilty and you have an appeal turned down, then they can lynch you. Okay? <laughs> now that's what we're supposed to have, not a pure democracy. But hey, how long has it been since you heard a national politician refer to the republic? They don't talk about the republic anymore, do they? Because uh, we don't have a republic anymore. We're the empire. And under the empire, whatever the emperor says goes. And that's the reason that they are pushing socialism. Socialism sounds great on paper. Well, we're going to take care of you from cradle to grave. But here's the problem. Under any socialist program, it requires central administration, central authority. Okay? Because you've got to make sure everybody gets their fair share, blah, blah, blah. Well, once you've got central authority, then you've got control. And this is what the rich people know, that they buy up and have that control. And that's just why they're pushing for a socialist system in the United States, in the UK, in Europe, and eventually the world. Slide. 